so it's pretty long. And human, uh, the human being are traced back to the Ice Age, uh, and you find all kinds of that stuff. It was the capital of one of the independent microstates in Germany, and uh, it is um, the, the written traces go back 890 years and has about 30,000 inhabitants. So this is uh, the ESAP, which took place two years ago, uh, four years ago. Uh, maybe you could not remember the picture that has been taken in front of the university building. Uh, before ESAP, that year, there was the Bach Festival. Actually, the Bach Festival will happen next week again. And that's where uh, we'll speak about the same, give the same presentation. And that's due to the fact that about 300 years ago, someone with the name Johann Sebastian Bach, Bach, easy for Dutch people, difficult for French and English people, lived and worked in the city. So he wrote their things like the world has a piano, and this is the of well, his handwriting for it, or uh, the Klavierbüchlein for Anna Magdalena Bachin. Um, that's and you see the date it was written in curtain. And most of you who played who played the piano uh, uh, during being a pupil and played pieces of that. Yes, that's it. so. I asked the same question in Reno at uh, uh, Smart Solutions, and nobody, no hands. So that's the difference between the U.S. and... <laughs> okay, this is the piece with the original end. For the seven years, uh, as you know, uh, Bach moved from Köthen to Leipzig, and there has been a lot of research about his time in Leipzig. He was there for many, many, many more years, so 27 years he lived in Leipzig, and Kurt was just before. And about the curtain time, there's a lot more uncertainty than about the Bach time, so the research was different. And uh, the open, open question for about 120 years is, where did he live? What's now Prince Leopold of Anhalt Curtin, that's him, he uh, um, was an important prince. Other princes were far less important than were princes in history, they were just doing party every day and burned all the money they had. So but unlike those princes that have no influence, there was 100 years before uh, Prince Ludwig who founded the first German society for the German language, Fruchtling the Gesellschaft. And um, so Leopold did two important things. First of all, he hired Bach. And secondly, he enlarged the city by two areas, the west and the east. And that was the only expansion of the city between the mid-ages mid and uh, the industrialization in the 19th century. So what people want to try now is use Bach as a tourist attraction. And so uh, the Kölner Bachgesellschaft, that is the city-owned society, headed by Georg Schäfer, um, decided to do some, to improve the touristic thing. And they decided to do a feasibility study sponsored by public money and tied it with the question, uh, find out everything about Bach and Kirk, specifically where did he live. So the other question were just there, just in case we don't find where, where they live, where, 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 where. <coughs> So this is the title of the feasibility study. And then they did a bidding, as you know, <coughs> was a bidding by everybody, they knew up front who should win, and uh, so they wrote everything in there, and believe me or not, we won the bidding, and um, we are the oldest smaller company, so it's strange that we find a bidding about finding about. These are our buildings, so this is not an up-to-date picture of our curtain, curtain office, and that's the Dortmund office, and uh, um, the software we have been doing here, so the idea of these people were, if they were researching without computers for 120 years and didn't find out, we need to do other means, and in the sense was using computers to find out where the buffalo was. That was the original idea, that's why they brought us into the picture. 
The project was started on the 23rd of March 2006 and took a little bit less than two years. It had to be expanded several times, but it's over now. Uh, we did it in uh, four phases and started as an agile project, so like a software project. We knew where we wanted to go, but we did not know how to approach it. So uh, that, but we did four phases anyway, but it turned out that the phases were interleaving all the time. Um, and very early we decided we will allow every logical way of decision taking. And that's something very key and key, because until then, there was only one methodology being used. Find a piece of paper and prove it from there. So only a positive proof was the, the methodology being used. And we said we also went to allow negative proofs. So he could not have lived in any building but these, or this, something. And um, if you do it the other way around, you know this from mathematics proof things, you have to exclude all the alternatives, so, so you need to have a very broad approach. And um, so in this case, we need to have information about all homes in the city of good. So the first phase was the drill down phase to do what are the important questions, what are the approaches, etc. etc. So as it was big team of up to 30 people, they had to be all streamlined and uh, do all this. In phase two, we started, we wanted to do a collection. Collection means we wanted to get all the documents, all the literature um, into the computer. And so we went to libraries, antique bookshops, EB and archives, and scanned the material, OCR'd it, made it to Word documents, and uh, typed handwritten documents manually, so you have to read the old documents. This is the total uh, number of documents we had, were um, 700 documents with 14,000 pages. And as this is a relatively big amount, there was a filter, so not only some percentages of uh, the material really got scanned and entered into the system. If we were browsing through the material and said it's pointless to have that, we laid, left it aside. Now the problem was how to use the computer. And the basic idea was to do a semantic network. That was the idea. And as some of you might know, there are two semantic network systems on the market, both written in Smalltalk. The first one is K-Infinity. K-Infinity was presented at ESAC in Essen long ago, seven years ago. Um, and it's uh, sold by a Darmstadt company. It's going back to research at GMD and GID when they were still uh, in existing. Now it's Fraunhofer Institute at Darmstadt. And um, it's used by uh, the police for doing their research stuff. The second one is Atlas TI. Atlas TI comes from Berlin originally created at the Department of Psychology. Uh, it's more oriented to data mining in, and data uh, analysis of non-numeric way. So it is the SPSS for non-numbers. Uh, the problem with that was it's not extensible. So we had to mix both. So we had data from the houses, and you will see soon, and we are unstructured data in form of text. And Atlas TV is not extendable. It, it would be, but the company only sells. It's a VSE thing. They only sell the ready-made software. And uh, then we tried Google Desktop, and that was not popular at all. So at the end, we said, OK, yes? One more thing again. What about when there's too many manual steps for creativity? You have to take, uh, copy, and paste all the document contents into it. No yeah. interface to work. You couldn't split that? Yeah. yeah. That was more work uh, than doing it our own. So, so the, the semantic network thing was not the biggest thing. And we wanted to try CSAC. That was prior to the Seabreeze initiative. So Seabreeze only started, which was so yesterday, after this was done. So what I will show here is native uh, CSAC. So we built uh, GH Bachnets. 
that has been developed according to the requirements of the project during the project time. And um, it was done in a way that the researcher on Bach and the programmer worked closely together. So every requirement, like, like Capital, which we heard uh, yesterday, every idea the researcher had was implemented immediately. And the UI is a web browser because it was a distributed team. And um, it represents textual information and numeric information in the same system. And the uh, text data, which I will show later, it's shown in graphically using uh, uh, Adrian Bondrian and uh, 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 SVG and uh, in tables at the same time. And uh, uh, so the problem was to find information hidden in mountains of letters in some documents. So we use a classical approach using VisualWorks and Gemstone architecture. And uh, so we use VisualWorks for the sophisticated part, for the semantic network, and for the c user interface, and Gemstone to handle the persistencies. And um, for the algorithm, you may have noticed that earlier this year, uh, Torsten won the uh, Java competition. Where's Torsten? Okay. Uh, and we used his algorithm uh, to research the texts and uh, um, put it into Gemstone and around the Gemstone. Uh, the interesting part is in a semantic network, you have the <coughs> idea of a notion. And notions are sort of classes, and we try to put them in the right place in the class hierarchy. And it turned out that it is a sibling of class class. And uh, so it's not a, a place, a subclass of class description. Uh, it's not a place uh, where you would normally program. Like you were trained yesterday by meta, meta, meta programming. So we used a similar approach and they did. And we entered notions as a sibling of class and relation and value as subclasses. And um, uh, so the, the, the way to do it, because notions have instances, and these instances have another instance. <laughs> so we have a three level thing. That's why it turns out to be a um, meta thing. And um, in VisualWorks, which we use um, as well as Squeak, it's permitted to extend the meta level of the system. Uh, Jensen doesn't allow that. Uh, and other small ones that don't allow them. But the classic <laughs> studio would not allow them. And uh, so we were pretty well done with <coughs> using it in Gemstone, uh, in, in visual words. So when moving the stuff to Gemstone, we just could represent the, the, the constructor for the networks in Gemstone, but not the, ne the, the network itself. So when the network is just built, then the objects are copied from uh, Gemstone. <coughs> Special object is the temporal object because we are doing history, and in history you always have to care about time, and uh, you have a temporal moment or a temporal interval. Uh, sometimes you have very sharp information about time, sometimes you have very vague information of time, and what you want to do, you want to argue about time because that's very important in looking at historical documents. When did it happen? If you have an information about what Bach did in 1694, then that's pointless because that was 13 years before he came to Curtin. So, Holmes and Inheritance of Curtin, which was one of the prime sources of our information, is going to the tax register. And believe it or not, for hundreds of years, the tax registers are still there. And um, so what we did, we used uh, an Excel spreadsheet and copied them, typed them. Why did we use this? This is the list of all people who paid home taxes. And it doesn't speak where the buildings are, but it speaks about the owner and the amount of money to be paid. Uh, we use that information in combination with the detail, with, with the, with, with, sketches of buildings 
of 1806, that's 100 years later. So we had to follow up who owned this building year by year because the taxes were always the same. At least some sorts of taxes were the same. The shoss, what they call it. Other taxes changed, but this tax was always the same throughout the 100 years. So we could find a, a line in time to 1806 and further on to 1819. But between 1818 and 1819, the Italis was changed in the sequence. So we had to do relatively clever pattern matching. And then we used detailed plans of 1855 and 2003. And then we had a homage list uh, when the prince was in, inaugurated. And that's a very important list because it doesn't only give the homeowners, it only also gives the, love, the people who rented the homeowners. But that's too early. That is 15 months before, or 6, 17, 17 months before Bach came to Berlin. It's bad. So uh, we don't have any kind of, there was no, no, no homage during the time when uh, Bach was there. So there's no, no real lists. Otherwise, it would be an old problem, an uh, old solution. So we transferred all that information to the same network. And there we could see. Uh, according to today's addresses, where everybody lived. These are the tax kinds. Now, you don't go over it. My point number eight is very important. Uh, that's the right to group here. <laughs> there was a special tax to this. And at some years, you can see that 60% of the homes had the right to group <laughs> <laughs> Today, we still have a brand called Kirkner Beer, but that's brewed somewhere in South of Frankfurt. <laughs> and there's one thing called Schutzgeld. Schutzgeld is still used for other, in a different thing, different meaning to that. It is a, hmm? uh, In some areas, yes. Uh, but uh, mostly, uh, they had to brew fresh beer, and when it was fresh, it was okay. They couldn't, have, they couldn't have cool beer. And that's why they use different ways of making beer, what they call Obergeld. Mm -hmm. And um, so we started off with these text files and uh, <coughs> copied them into Excel tables. And they were imported using ComConnect, which we actually what you find in the of 7.6 has been written upon the requirement of this project. So the nice browsers and things, and because I said, I don't want to grab a line with this. I want to have a nice user interface. And he did it for me. <laughs> and uh, then, uh, uh, out of that information, Carson, who did the presentation yesterday, mainly did the work of building up the semantic network. And they're using uh, Seaside, Mondrian, and uh, SVG as the presentation. And this was the UI for the research. So that was our starting point. This is a picture of one of those books. And there are binders like this, and you have to go through 100 of them. And each is this thick. And this is just one page. And I think you can do it. That is the Excel table, which shows the uh, condensed information. This is basically a pretty early one, uh, because it shows 1716, and there are not much more. But doesn't matter which one you think. They all look the same. And this is the final thing. So this is now the house Wall Street 17. <coughs> Those of you who know Clinton, it's pretty close to the position where we had um, the reception on the roof, just across the street from there. And you can see that the house is in the middle, and the tax, it has a few uh, tax payments on the left hand side and on the right hand side you see the list and you see that the tax payment starts in 1741 and you see immediately he can't have lived there the house is too new <coughs> okay so that was just an example i took that example because one of the women working at Bachgesellschaft, that's her that's the house where she was born okay so the central question is, or was, 
where did Johann Sebastian Bach live? We don't care about uh, Frau we care about Johann Sebastian Bach. We could also have other questions now, but that's what we care about. So when it came up with the idea, said, okay, we have a postal system then. It's, it did work. And um, it was fully functional. That's a drawing of those. It's, no, the drawing is, is uh, done around 1900. But it shows how it was. And even the fees are known. So from Curtin to Erfurt, the price was two Groschen, which is about 10 US dollars to send a letter from Curtin. That's all known. So why not look at one of those letters and find out whether Bach um, uh, fully funded so, yes. um, so this is actually a letter Bach wrote. Uh, from two effort, that's the letter. <coughs> Here is the price, two caution up there. And um, do we find an address? Here? Yes, deren hochwohlfesten hochwohl. So it's all about titles, professions, and town. And the center is down here. And there's the word Bach. You want to pass the Bach. And it just gives his title, Fürstlicher. Of music. That's all. So, does it help? No. <laughs> so, Curtin basically had three kinds of homes. Some homes belonged to the city, and other homes belonged to the duke, to the prince. And for the one homes, for those in the city, there are the taxes from the city. For the others, there are the rental agreements with the prince. And both are there. So, and um, we know that if Bach would, Bach's name would occur in it, you can be absolutely sure someone else would have found the document. So that's something we guessed up front. So Bach's name is in no text list. He, he is also not in the, in the list of people who had to pay personal taxes, Schutzgeld, because everyone who worked for the prince was exempt. So he was tax exempt anywhere, and he did not rent a house from the king. Now, this is the oldest view of curtain of 1650 from Marianne. And can you do something with this? Find the house where I live? No. <laughs> this is the oldest map of curtain. And actually, inter interestingly enough, this map is north. Normal maps are not north in, of those days. So you have maps in all directions. And um, the interesting thing with this map is this is the center city of the map. And this is now Google Earth uh, showing <coughs> the city. And if you today, if you map them one of the other, you see that the structure of the today's city and the structure of the city of the 18th century are exactly the same. So no big change at all in the time. So what you find today in houses is those one of the 18th century. It's better to use this map because it's clearer, it's a little bit newer, and the rest of the presentation I will show you this map. It's of uh, 1778, and as I told you, there was only one expansion, and so this is, was accurate also for last. This is the center of the city, and actually, when you go to the city today, you see two city walls. The old city wall, which is this one, and a new city wall, which is basically around the entire city. So this is where the new wall is. That's the old wall. And the most are still partly there. So you can still see them today. So and you can see from that point that when Bach came there, uh, we had to find a way. When did they build the new wall? And part of the project was a finding that we now exactly know the date. It was at the 24th February 1719, when they started to build the new wall. So, few facts are known about uh, Johann Sebastian Bach's uh, uh, home. So, it's known that he had to have a spacious home. It's even documented in a Hamburg newspaper that he used four wagons to transport all of his material from Curtin to Leipzig, so, and to put Filled four wagons, you must have had a big home. 
Um, so expelled students lived with him, and the Hofkapelle, that was his orchestra, uh, did their exercises in Basel. That's that. So in history, in, if you browse all the documents, you can see that uh, there are a set of candidates which have been mentioned uh, to be potential homes of Johann Sebastian Bach. So the other buildings which we looked at have no sign at all that they are potentially uh, being used by Bach. So it, uh, from, um, uh, we did not find any new records on top of those buildings. <coughs> Um, that there were might be candidates. So we looked at the potential Bach homes, and this is the first one we looked at. <laughs> it's basically an empty space now, and um, that was uh, uh, something interesting. It was built in <coughs> too late, so we couldn't have lived there because it was built too late. Um, not that this particular building was built too late, but. That was one of the extensions of the city made by the prince. That's right. And it's also known who was the first renter of that home. But it was just built in June 1721, which is just almost in Bach left. That is the next one. That's over there. And that's just too small. It's a very small piece. And then there was a name that so this is a list of 17, uh, 1855, when you see the name Bach and the word Erhard. Uh, so we look, what's going on with this? Why is this there? And there's a lot of argumentation in the history about it and find out about it. And uh, we found out that this home is this one, also too small. Uh, so it couldn't be Holzmark 12. But um, there must be something going on with Erhard and and uh, um, Bach, because otherwise they wouldn't have made this remark. So is that an explanation for that remark? We found it out. So uh, it could be Holzmann. Too. And the other home is Marktstraße, that's close to where the, um, where the <coughs> Rathaus, the town hall is. So it's very, very small piece. And also there were shops in there, so, as they are today. And so it couldn't be that Moir Heider wants to argue about Stiftstrasse 11 because there is a plate there showing potential Bach on this on this sign. That's that's by the Catholic Church for those who were in Britain, close to the castle. And uh, actually, this building is off. The, it, we don't talk about this building as building because that was built in late 19th century, but uh, about the location. And there's a lot of arguing, there was between a lot of arguing and tracing because um, someone reported something about the Witwe Schulze, we know, that he would live there. But uh, interestingly enough, <coughs> 60 years later, someone found a document where she lived at this building and was so enthusiastic about it. But we could trace that they only have the same information, and it's basically worthless. So there's a lot of argumentation in here. Who argues how? The way we did this was is called um, biometric analysis. So a bi bibliometric analysis, bibliometric. Uh, maybe I had a beer too, too much last night. <laughs> Thank you, by the way. It was good. Um, so uh, uh, bibliometric analysis tries to find out who quotes who. And by that, we could follow up how did the older researchers argue in, his, in, in, in working on the history. And this was pretty tough work to do the bibliometric analysis on that building. But it turned out that the argument was weak. They were presented. So because we got to Hartung's source, Hartung is uh, someone who brought this up in the book 1900. And, uh, <coughs> Um, he just called it a guess, and there's no reason to be surprised when I find the document back again. So this building is also among, it's remaining the three homes of Johann Andreas Nautsch. So that was the rich man, he had three homes. 
And uh, it is, we now, this is the first one, that's a new building, Buddha Mark III, that's where you have your shop. So we're selling um, um, cloth. And um, uh, that is too small also as Holzmark, uh, as um, Marktstraße 11. So it's just too small, so it couldn't be this one. Now we come to this interesting building. As you can see immediately, it has been built in for the 20th anniversary of the GDR in 69. Uh, that is a plate there which shows this as contact calls. And uh, it's actually, we found it. That's one of the homes of Johann Sebastian. Actually, the, it has a number and had a few owners went through and um, it's one of the largest homes of Kirtan. I uh, had to pay uh, two dollars and 99 groschen uh, home tax, that's 265 US dollars. About, you can say the dollar is 70 euros, those of you who do euros, rather than dollars. And uh, only six homes of the 451 homes had a higher tax. So it's a very, very big home in the center of the city. And this is how it looked about 100 years, a little bit more than 120 years ago. And um, uh, the, this is how it looks now. And the arguments <coughs> for this are that the predecessor, that Johann Andreas Nautsch, got directly paid by the prince for uh, having Stricker, who was the predecessor of Bach, as the director of the Hofkapelle, exercised in this home. And the same amount of money was given to Bach that they could practice in his home. So that's one of the arguments. Another argument is that Bach didn't like the home because there is a close by water mill, and the water mill was clock, clock day and night. And so you can only compose music with, with one speed. <laughs> <laughs> so the rattling mill is well documented. And um, so then these are the arguments. This, there's one more. Wall Street 25-26. So in these are the, the literature about it, so there was <coughs> arguments pro and con about this home in the mid of the 20th century. So someone said yes, and other people said no, and they interpreted <coughs> figures, etc., etc. And um, actually, Waltz Wallstraße it was a tiny uh, way around the city between Magdeburg and Hallischen Summers. So, uh, and there were gardens there, and there was a, a manufactory for silver and uh, gold fiber to have beautiful costumes, and uh, called Fabrik. And there were gardens of wealthy citizens along this. And on the 27th February 1719, Prince Leopold took the decision to build a new extension to the city. And uh, uh, the, when you look at the map, these are the only streets which are straight. That's Barak. So you have straight roads. The older roads are all winding. And um, there's more in there, and importantly, there's a property tax that the rule that says the homeowners will only pay tax when all homes are built. And you know what this result was? <laughs> they kept a few places empty as long as they could. So this is a, a, a drawing we found, uh, which gives the original owners of the gardens and how they were built. It. And here you find Lauch. <coughs> then you also find Stange. I will speak, give one word about Stange later. Okay, so taxation only started in 1730 because then they changed the law. So it will only be three years tax exempt and not as long as possible. And believe it or not, immediately the rest of the land parcels were built. 
This is another drawing. So the thematic network answers when the, the home was built anyway. You can do this with this home, which is now the home where the mayor, uh, the, the mayor of the city lives. And as all of the others, the taxation starts in 1730, but we can find out the guy sold his other home in 19 to move here. That's something we can find here. So he moved 1719 in Svalbard where he lived in a different home, Kleiner Plan 2, that's more close to the castle, small home. And then he moved here and he was 11 years, on 10 years tax exempt. And someone else moved into uh, Kleiner Plan Okay, why Shazen 25, 26? It's documented, it's built in, in 12. 12 is, is just wrong, but look at the numbers. Twos and nines are very similar, and they just misinterpreted one of those figures. So correct is the home was the, the home was built in 1790 by Johann Andreas Lauch, and the first renter was Johann Sebastian Bach. This is the list of owners, and interestingly enough, you find the word Erhard again here. So another argument that the coloration of Erhard and Bach living in the same home at different times, actually is uh, correct. So, what we have found are many positive hints that Johann Sebastian Bach lived first in Schalaunische Straße 44, then moved to Waldstraße 25, 26, and we have no not futable negative statements found. So, the result is, initially he lived in this building, and then he moved to that one. Below. And interestingly enough, the monument is already at the right place. <laughs> <laughs> the monument has been built in the 19, uh, 1885, so for its 200th birthday. And uh, if you look at this picture, you see the Bauhaus again. You saw the picture already before when I was speaking about our. This is our office. And that's the Bauhaus. So it's only two hours. <laughs> so that's it. Transcription 
of German characters. So if you don't have the UGA signs available in your alphabet, it is always correct to put the E. Not, don't forget the, 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 the signs, just write it over. Right, but why, 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 so that map was a translation? Oh, oh, just these are maybe some design sometimes. So. And if they write in Latin, they something sometimes also speak of potential, <laughs> so they're Latinized words. So they were much more flexible in the past to translating words. Christian. So we couldn't make use of them because uh, we couldn't get our data easy enough. That was the basic point. But otherwise, we can't. Otherwise, uh, uh, so, so one of them, and neither one did permit the uh, interaction between numeric and non numeric things. So uh, we had to do transformations. Like the money thing is something interesting. So because it's all in Talas, Hoshin, and Kenyuk. So and it is like the old English system, so it's. Uh, 20, 24, and then it's 1.10 or something. So it was more practical purposes. And, and we are programmers in the country. And we are small tracks, so it was pretty easy to, to, to do it again. So that was not the hurdle. Yes? So did you get feedback from historians to your research? Yes, sure we did. Um, some of them say, yes, we found it. And others said, we don't accept your methodology <laughs> because you did not find the piece of paper that we were looking for because we know it doesn't exist. But that was the that was the argument. Um, no more questions. So I will give the same for, for all of those who want to hear it again next Wednesday in Curtin at Bach Festival. I will do it again. <laughs>